waiting for two seconds. Hi, and welcome to makingcomics.com. Uh, get a grasp, MOOC, hang out on air where we are talking about uh, scheduling and setting goals uh, to set yourself up for success. That's what's going on. This is the third week of our MOOC. Um, we've been having a really great time. We're almost finished. We have only one week left after this, and uh, there's some really exciting stuff coming down the pipeline. Um, we're going to take a minute to, to do, do some introductions and hear why people want to be on this particular panel. Um, so like I said, I'm the CEO of makingcomics.com uh, and the lead instructor for the course. My name is Patrick. Uh, next, we'll go to Lucy. Oh, hello. Um, my name is Lucy Bellwood. I'm a cartoonist living in Portland, Oregon. I work at Periscope Studio with a bunch of other cool folks. Um, and I really wanted to be on this particular podcast because I love helping people get over uh, fear and anxiety about creative output. It's a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, so I wanted to address that a little bit in the panel today. Where do you last, Kevin? So I'm going to go straight to Jen. Sorry, I was, I was on mute again. Um, I wanted to be on this panel because I have dealt with schedules on the cartoonist side as a cartoonist in my free time and also as a part of the marketing team at Fanagraphics Books. And actually, uh, I guess a, a great example of not making a deadline or not making it to a certain point was uh, documented in the documentary Cartoon College about my time at CCS. So watch my shame. It was a very good documentary. <laughs> Just, just saying. Jared. Hey, uh, my name is Jared. Uh, I draw little pictures, um, and sometimes I paint them. Um, my stuff is at jaredlovestodraw.com, uh, and I do a webcomic twice a week that is uh, updates Tuesdays and Fridays, and that's Pea Green Coffee Cup. And then I also do short stories, and uh, which are on the Jared Loves to Draw, and Anthro Animal Journal Comics. <clears throat> I, uh, I decided to do this panel uh, because it's something that fascinates me and um, time and strict schedules, something I had to deal with a lot. And so uh, I'm interested in other people's process too and how they deal with things and deal with their schedules or day jobs and things like that too. So um, I was really excited about this panel. Uh, Eric. Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Shanauer. I live in San Diego, California. I've been a freelance cartoonist for nearly 30 years. Currently, I write and draw Age of Dawn, which is my retelling of the Trojan War, and it's published by Image Comics. I recently finished writing the scripts for Little Nemo Return to Slumberland, which is going to be published by IDW starting in August, and with art by Dave Rodriguez. Uh, my work has also been published by DC, Marvel, Dark Horse, Fanagraphics, Archie, Bongo, SLG, Random House, HarperCollins, and the BBC, among others. Um, I'm on this panel because I think Patrick's doing a lot of really great things of uh, teaching about creating comics, and he asked me to, to be on it, so I thought, sure. And when he sent me the schedule, this is the only Wednesday night I had free, so here I am. There you go. Damon. Hi, my name is Damon Gentry, and uh, I co-created a book called Sabretooth Swordsman with my buddy Aaron Conley that just came out from Dark Horse Comics this previous November. Um, I thought it would be a good fit for this panel because I enjoy problem solving and uh, not ruining things as much as possible. And Christy. That's me. Yeah. Um, I, my name's Christy Blanche. I wrote the, or I, um, I'm on this panel because Patrick asked uh, very nicely. It is a Wednesday that I could do. As everybody knows, it's it's New Comic Book Day, so it's a crazy, crazy schedule. I also um, am the world's best procrastinator, um, so I thought that this would be good to learn from everybody else. And I write um, a, a webcomic, the Damnation of Charlie Wormwood for Thrillment.com, and I am also a fellow teacher along, uh, just like our esteemed guide here, Patrick, and I teach the uh, Super Moot, which is, this time it is social issues through comic books. Last year we did the gender through comic books. And I own a comic book store. 
Alter Ego Comics. So everybody here, send me your comics, and I'll put them in there. There you go. And, and last but not least, our, our embedded journalist. Hi, guys. I'm Kevin. Um, I work with MakingComics.com doing the content scheduling and development, and uh, I'm... I'm on this panel because Patrick told me to be here, uh, and uh, I'm also I'm doing the uh, the 13th Dimension article that we post every Monday for the MOOC course. So I'll be live tweeting this event. If you guys have Twitter, you can follow me um, at Color the Books for inspirational quotes that pop up during this uh, during this panel. I, I feel like I have all this this power over everybody right now. <laughs> There's this this thread of Overlord <laughs> Pat, Patrick Eric having a lot of power. Okay, so um, yeah, and it's causing me to speak in the third person. Uh, I, I really actually think that scheduling is is super important, and I kind of geek out about it. If you couldn't tell from the uh, three different articles that I wrote for MakingComics.com, including the tutorials on how to use Excel spreadsheets to maximize your productivity, um, I, I just really get into this idea of tracking your work and thinking about it mathematically and, and breaking it down into small attainable goals because before I was a project-based teacher um, for the last, that, that's what I did for the last six years, I didn't know that you could achieve stuff and almost gamify the way that you're thinking about your work. Um, so we're going to launch straight into questions about this topic. Um, and the first one is how long did it take each of you to finish your first successful comic and what is the average time now to finish one? Um, I haven't finished one at all, so let's go down the list with somebody else. Uh, who wants to go first? We should go with Eric. I think Eric can go first. How about that? I go Eric, Jen, and then uh, Lucy. Okay. And then Damon. <laughs> Eric, your mic. You yeah, I think it's frozen. Hey, you're on. Your your mic is muted, Eric. Uh, I, anyway, uh, so let's go with Jen. <laughs> we'll um, get Eric on. Uh, he'll figure out how to mute. Self censored. I, I assume by successful you mean printed and handed to people in exchange for money. So um, I'm gonna go with that definition. And it was a 24. Uh oh. They're dropping like flies. I'm actually <laughs> just sabotaging everybody's feed. So Lucy, Lucy, this is not going to work. No, no. I think we'll all perish. Jen, we, we kind of lost you. I don't know if you can hear us, but I can we hear. lost you for a second. You want to you wanna start over again? We'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll um, edit this out in the podcast. Don't worry. Just get, just get, let's get, keep going. Uh, it was a 24-page comic. It took about two months. I was in school. I had a part-time job, and now it can take... Uh, the same amount of time for a 24-page comic or more because I also have a job. <laughs> but my pay, my hand speeds a lot faster. So. Yeah, as the quality of the comics, I guess that and this is Kuya from Toronto, um, Canada, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. So, um, uh, has the quality shifted? Even though the time hasn't really shifted. Definitely, yeah. I would assume it better, or someone's lying to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy? Um, so the first successful comic I did was uh, this 36-page comic um, called True Believer, which I was doing on top of going to school full-time and working a job, and it took um, about three months, I think. It's uh, it's colored, too. It has, you know, like, ink wash stuff inside of it. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, and... I actually, thinking about it, I haven't completed a project that long since then. Most of the stuff that I've been doing has been shorter, but I definitely say that it's it's an uh, inescapable product of drawing more is that you get faster and your confidence improves. And even if it's taking me, like Jen, the same amount of time to do stories like that, I think I'm a little faster. Let's say like I could you know pencil two pages and ink three pages and color four pages a day if you're parsing it out and like doing nothing else. But I think with the added skill comes like added complexity to the work, so it probably still takes me the same amount of time, maybe a little bit less, but I have more to bring to the table now than I did before. Damon? So, uh, Sabertooth Swordsman was the first full-length book that Aaron and I completed uh, that clocked in at about 106 pages, and that took uh, almost a year and a half 
So we were both working uh, day jobs and juggling all sorts of stuff. Uh, and Aaron's artwork is very, very intricate and detailed. And then once I got the inks from him, I put grayscale and lettering on it. So we were just a two-man team uh, working on that book for about a year and a half. What was the other half of the question about? How well, fast are you now? How fast yeah, are we now? What's, is probably it, is slower. It changed? Probably, <laughs> probably slower. Um, we're we because we want we want to to ramp the difficulty up. Like, what did we not try in the first book that we can bring to the table with our next outing? How can we keep things progressive? Like, still maintain the the level of quality that we put in, but also like ratchet things up a bit to uh, another level. You know, just keep improving as much as possible, which. It's it's not gonna it's not gonna go faster. <laughs> well, it's interesting because there seems to be this kind of uh well one thing to draw even out of the three uh things that we've just gotten is do you just create more work like is it like starting with perfect work and I don't think it is it sounds like everybody's kind of um, working within a, a period of time and using whatever that time is to work on comics. And then trying to push that envelope further and further. It's not about saving time. It's about doing better work. Does yeah, it's about sense? doing doing the best with what you have. And then, you know, the next time around, there's certain things where you just have to accept if you ever want to finish anything that it's not going to be perfect. And Absolutely. bring the hatchet down. And then the next time, say, hey, I can try that thing that I wanted to try. And I definitely think that um, everyone should be working on, you know, their own projects. But at some point, if you find yourself getting too precious with something, um, Working for somebody else, like drawing someone else's story or on a deadline that is not self-imposed. I'm sure this is a point everyone is going to make later, but I've gotten way faster drawing for other people than I would ever for myself. Yeah, well, that was going to be my follow-up question was uh, just as a part of that, what, what is the... Because it's not like um, even with Damon, you just said that with uh, Sabretooth Swordsman, you, you just signed with Dark Horse again for another, uh, another book. Like, how long do they give you to work on your stuff? Well, that's a good question, because we did manage to blow through several deadlines <laughs> in the making of the first book. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, nobody was anticipating a debut book, so there was no, like, there was no real pressure, uh, which I'm thankful for, because we were able to, you know, within reason, make it as good as we wanted to. Like, it's never going to be perfect, like you guys were saying, and Lucy was saying, like, at some point, you just kind of have to drop the axe and, and let the let the product exist, and then shoot for more next time. Um, I think I think there's something uh, I think there's something to be said too about ideas uh, being put on the shelf and that that's sometimes okay like I think sometimes ideas need to bake a little bit longer uh, for you to get like a good idea so if you do take a break and go work on something else or diversify the projects that you're working on or the medium that you're working on if you go paint or you go do some different kind of art that's always good. Um, yeah. Well, and, and and that's probably different though when you're when you're looking at work you're getting paid for, right? That has kind of a deadline. And I'm kind of interested in how artists negotiate with the idea that that work needs to come out and when it needs to come out for. Um, well, it's definitely it's definitely a good idea to uh, try at least in small doses all different types of work because you need to figure out what you enjoy doing most, and you need to n learn to negotiate the pitfalls of. of the different types of work, whether it's like freelance or working for corporations or, or working for other people or collaborating or doing your own uh, project by yourself. Like there's there's all sorts of give and take and uh, advantages and disadvantages to each approach. And you might find one that you re that really suits you best. Um, right. But, but it's just good to see where other people are coming from and to understand how processes work in general because that's always going to inform the quality of your personal product. It makes you a better collaborator too. I think you know everyone appreciates it if you actually understand how they do what they do. Christy and I have been kind of talking about this a little bit because uh, I'm going to be taking over for the art on uh, the Charlie Wormwood comic coming up soon. But um, Christy, do you want to talk a little bit about the turnaround time, like for artwork at Thrillbent, and how that gets kind of expected of the artist over there? <laughs> Ah, uh, um, yeah, for for me it's pretty much, um, I can't talk about all thrill bent because everybody's on different schedules. And I know they're very, they try and be very strict about if you say you're going to have something completed, they want it completed. Um, the only person to ever miss a deadline there has been John Rogers and he's co-founder, so that made it okay. Uh, nobody yelled at him. Well, Mark might have. Um, 
<laughs> but we usually take um, the thing. The different thing about Thrill then is their their weekly installments. So we have what we call um, screens. We just have you know like six to eight screens that we're trying to to get in each week. So uh, for me, uh, my previous artist, Chi, uh, before I was lucky enough to snag Patrick, um, he would take about a week uh, to do those six to eight screens, which is one installment, which four installments pretty much makes up one standard 32 page um, comic. So uh, it's, it's about, you know, a page a day. Yeah, and I'm I, I'm kind of wondering from the other artists because it sounds like I mean from from the people I've talked to in the industry like that page a day kind of sounds like the the if you can do that you know that that's great if you can fit in starting a second page that's kind of really good um, and that's what I've heard from most people um, but I'm wondering how do you tackle a project like say you get a script for like like several pages that you're working on. Do you do all the thumbnailing at once? Do you work on it one page at a time? Like, how how is how how what is the different processes that you guys go through? Um, and feel free to jump in if you have an answer to that. Well, I definitely think it depends on who you're working with and how, when they want their checkpoints to be, um, like revisions. And that's something you should actually talk to them beforehand because then you can figure out like maybe that. Hundred dollars for drawing a poster isn't good if they want three revisions. You know, after you've already inked it. Um, <laughs> I'm not talking from personal experience, like last month. All, um, it's a burlesque show, though, so you know. Um, uh, but yeah, so I usually what I do is I'll offer um, some like character sketches, um, and then they can look at my thumbnails. Uh, or I might do like super messy thumbnails, but then like some legible ones with like the you know the script next to it that they'll be able to see. So if something is paced too slowly or if the mood is wrong, then they can point it out before any serious work gets like gets done. No, that's 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 a really good point. I think the idea of establishing your check-in points before you start working is probably like a really big deal. Um, is it different? Say Lucy, is it different for when you're not working with? A team of people. Um, how does how does that work internally? I was actually just gonna say I think it's equally valuable to have checkpoints for yourself um, yeah. because I, like Jared was saying, taking a break, walking away from something, going and working on a different project. I, I realize the other reason I'm slower now is I'm working on a lot more things concurrently than I was before, um, and it's actually there's something to be said for that. Where if you're getting bogged down in pencils or like the inks are taking forever, it's really nice to be able to just go and write a script for some other thing that's not that thing. Um, and gen just personally, my preference is to do all those things in sequence. Um, the only time I've done like a page a day thing was I did a, a three week trip down the Grand Canyon last year and drew and colored a page of comics every day that I was down there. And that was like a, the only time that I've done a page completely and then before moving on to the next one. But I think if I have the time and the luxury, I'd much rather do all the planning and then all the more planning and then all the inking and then all the, yeah. You get my point. <laughs> um, so the next question is for Jen, uh, and this is an interesting question. How would you go about using social media, et cetera, to promote your work while creating a production schedule? Would you recommend promoting your work before it's completed or waiting until you have something finished for more ideal? That's from Daniel S. in Utah. Yeah, that's a great question and one I actually kind of... Uh... <laughs> love because um, when and anyone get you know follows me on Twitter, I immediately well immediately but you know I'll check their um, profile and read them out. And half the time, what is it, 2014? It'll be like such and such web comic or book out in 2016, and I'm like, oh my god, like I am not gonna remember that. Like, um, so I definitely think promotion is a good idea. Um, so far, it is like a couple months, depending on how big your project is. No. If it's a serial, obviously, if you're getting published through a publisher of some kind, they have their own set schedule based on bookstores, comic book store schedules. But I think having a significant amount done, or at least realize, like, um, is a good idea, at least, especially if it's your first couple of projects. But then at some point, people want to be in at the ground floor. And that's why you know you've got websites and blogs and tumblers where people are like, you know, character sketches for something, and some people want to be there the entire way, but. I think having a lot of the work done um, is best for your schedule because every time you do promotions and marketing for it, 
you'll feel like you have more of the work done, and you don't actually. Well, and I, I think there's also something to be said. I, I do a lot, a lot, a lot of promoting, and, and I feel like the thing that people don't remember a lot of the time when, or at least it took me a long time to learn this, was that y you got to put more in substance-wise into your work than you do into promoting. I, I think that that's something that people need to really hear. Um, when I Last fall, I had an explosion because I did got this really silly tattoo on my arm, um, and uh, it went viral online. And everybody, I had like over twenty thousand hits in one day on my site. But because there wasn't any good comment, I wasn't like anticipating that. And because there were no like really great pieces of artwork up there, and not a lot of great comics, no one came back the next day. Like so, you know, uh, you can do promoting is a is a tough job. You don't know what's going to hit. You don't know what's going to like make you have a thousand hits in one day versus two <laughs> like one day. Um, and I think it just needs to be a part of your rhythm, but it shouldn't take over your process. Agreed. <laughs> I know, I know that I think that you should not promote anything until it's done because I see stuff on Facebook, where people say, I'm working on this and it's going to be great, and my attitude is like, well, how do you know it's going to be great? It's not even done. It doesn't even exist. And I just don't even pay attention. Why, why should I pay attention to something that's not done? That's what I figure everyone else is going to say if I were to go out there and say, I'm working on this great thing. It's going to be great. I'm not done. Yeah. I don't like the jinx stuff. No whammy, no whammy. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, um, it can also sap your own uh, mo momentum on the project if if you're telling people about it and they're going, oh great, that's great, and then your your sort of your mindset is sort of diffused out into the into the world and you're not concentrating on your project anymore. You're concentrating on what other people's reactions to your project that doesn't even exist yet are. Absolutely, the validation of getting you know likes and retweets and favorites and whatever. Um, just like Jen said, makes you feel like you've accomplished more than you have, and it's that little like mm -hmm. endorphin rush every time somebody pays attention to you on the internet. That's really seductive and super dangerous. Um, I, I would fall. I think I would fall somewhere between your two extremes. Like that, I think it is important to to share a certain amount of the work. But like Jen says, maybe a couple months out, you know, or once the bulk of it is finished, uh, and you don't have to make any value calls about it. You don't have to say this is going to be great. You can just say, here's the thing I'm working on. It oh, may that, be great. It might not be great. That, that's a whole nother can of worms, though. It's like, don't ever say your work sucks, because then you're like, yeah, oh, no, not that. No, 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 right. I don't believe in it. I don't need to read it. Like, it's like, like that's at some point, there's only so much time in the day, and. Uh, oh, that's been my biggest thing on online is is the steep discovery in the last three years of social promotion has been just finding out how inefficient it is to be negative about anything online. Like, it, it just takes like. It, you just don't want to be remembered for something that you complained about. Like, there's no reason, and 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 that's just so that you can become more visible online. Uh, but yeah, I, I can't, I, I can't do that positively. I, I agree. As someone that works in marketing and social media, um, I say if you're, you know, going to be on Twitter and Instagram as an artist and, and yourself, but it's like be real or be funny. Never be sad. Never be mad. So, I think. Um, I agree with Lucy that there has to be kind of a middle ground. Um, I don't think you should necessarily jump into things thinking it or telling people that it's going to be great because, um, well, I mean, you, like, you should approach every idea with gratitude and humility anyways, but you also can make things so big in your mind that it intimidates you and then you end up flopping and feeling like you can't get it done or you just don't get it done because it gets so big you completely lose control. But I also think that if you're doing a particular project and you know you have friends on Facebook or you have people that you know on Twitter who are your friends it doesn't hurt to show process every now and then because if that's what gets you to get stuff done it kind of it's whatever fuels your machine to get stuff done like there was a quote about Madonna that she needed the cameras to be Madonna or she wouldn't you know exist so if you need people to see what you're working on as you work on it to work on it then maybe try that. Um, I've done that with some projects, and then other projects um, aren't going to see any kind of light until they're like 90% done. I think. No, I, just yeah, I agree. I love showing those process. P 
pieces when, when you're working because I feel like I'm as a teacher, I'm more engaged with talking to people about the process of making comics and I geek out a little bit more about that. But it also doubly mm -hmm. promotes the work that I'm actually doing. Yeah, um, and you can now, connect with other artists. Now, I have a little problem where I'm kind of addicted to social media, so, like, there, there is, like, that double-edged sword. Um, right. And I just got this app called Self-Control, which actually goes in <laughs> and prevents you from accessing certain sites on a timer, like, at the core of your computer. So, I, like, when I'm working now, I turn that on, and I'm like, I can't go check Facebook right now. I have to, like, just work on comics. Like, this, this four hours is for drawing and I can see Google images, and I can do my reference photos, but I can't go to Facebook, I can't go to Instagram, I can't go to Tumblr, like, I can't, none, no. Because, you know, you can spend hours looking, <laughs> looking at that stuff. Um, so, uh, the next question is for everyone. Um, so, I'm going to try and pick on the people who haven't talked too, too much. How many projects do you balance at any given time? What strategies do you have to come up that help you tackle lengthy projects? And I think I'm going to go with uh, Christy and then Eric on this question. Of course you chose me. Because um, I can't say no. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I, I do a lot, but I find that the more I do, the more productive I am, which seems really counterintuitive, but it works. Um, right now I'm working on my dissertation. I'm writing my comic. I'm running my comic book store. I'm doing this, the super move. We have like 3,000 students. Um, I'm trying to, you know, spend some time with my daughter, and now moving. Yay! Um, but I, I think it's, I think it's, you just find as you go along how much you can handle. If I just had one project, I would get the same amount done as if I had the amount of projects I'm doing now. It just is one of those things that I drink a lot of coffee, um, probably more than I should, uh, but. And I work a lot, but that's 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 what I need. I need more projects to keep me going. I, that's what, what, is it, what is this coffee thing you speak of? I have never heard of. <laughs> You've never heard of it? I'll send I'll send you some. Okay, <laughs> I'd be okay with that. Eric, how do you manage all of your stuff you got going on? I basically I'm not very disciplined. Basically, I juggle things by deadline. Um, I know when deadlines are. I know I got to get a certain amount done, and I sort of work on things with a deadline in mind. If the deadline's closer on one project, then that's the project I'm going to be working on until it's done. Uh, that's uh, the other thing is I you know you have to learn to say no. And um, when I, I was at I went to the Hubert School and. Jose Delbo was one of my instructors, and one of the last things he said to me before graduation was, don't ever turn work down, but that can be really dangerous if people are offering you things and you don't have time to do everything. Uh, so you've got to learn to say no. You've got to learn to judge what you can accomplish within a given amount of time, and then you've got to be able to judge uh, what's coming in and whether you can do it or not. And say no if, if you can't. I, I definitely agree with saying no, which was something I had a problem with, especially when you're starting out, is that you're just excited people want to work with you, let alone give you some form of money or books or rent or something in return. So I try to say no like once a month if I can, um, especially if it's, you know, someone that, well, especially if it's anything that's like terrible, like exposure, which by the way, the the Twitter stream, I think it's called just for exposure. Art for exposure is one of the funniest things you've ever read. I can't follow it. It's actually too depressing to read. Because yeah. <laughs> they're, like, they're, they're like real Craigslist ads. Like it's, it's so good. <laughs> it's so bad. Um, uh, I just wanted to add real quick that as as freelancers, um, Mark Wade is as a freelancer. He's been one for like 25 years. He still has trouble saying no to projects, even though he's written things that have been, you know, kind of important. But he's still, that's why he started writing Green Hornet, because he just, he couldn't say no, because he's always still afraid where the next, you know, when the next project is going to be offered. So I think that's something that just sticks with freelancers. And I mean, to be honest, the thing that helps me say no is I have a support system of people outside of comics and outside of the things that I care about that know me on a different level. My wife is like an incredibly big supporter of what projects I should say yes to and which projects I definitely don't have time to do. Um, 
because anything that eats into her time is definitely a project I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> so um, that that that's been my that. But having that support system, investing in people in your personal life outside of your professional life, can allow you to know you have an identity outside of your work that can at, give you support for the work that you're going into. And I think that that's an incredibly important thing to have uh, for me anyway. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I like to encourage my friends to uh, just get like a like a if you can if you can find like an easy day job and I prefer kind of like an active one because when I'm at home working on comics all I do is sit in front of the computer so it's nice I have a day job where I just I'm just a janitor I clean condos and I walk around and vacuum all day and I get some light exercise and I feel better about myself and that allows me complete autonomy in my comic book work because I'm not beholden to accepting freelance work for a paycheck because we all need that that fresh fresh grilla to get the food in our mouths, <laughs> and, uh, and I prefer to I prefer to pay the bills with a with a day job that I don't mind so much, and then I make exactly the comics I want to make. That is another big thing. I'm gonna quote like Alec Longstreth of Basswood. Woo! Yeah, woo! He said there were three types of cartoonists. There, the ones where everything's on the line, like your full time cartoonist. You probably don't have time for all your personal projects, and obviously it's you get scared a lot. Um, you know, you're always like wondering where the next check's gonna come from. Um, there's the part-time ones. Um, I had a part-time job when I was a librarian at Center for Cartoon Studies, and it was great because then I could be choosy with my projects, but still didn't have to worry about it. But like, I didn't have health care, so right now I'm the third one, which is I have a full-time job, um, obviously one I love, and then I get to be pretty choosy with my projects, but I I still go for ones that make money. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I mean, Jason, if if you ever get a chance, uh, check out Unnatural Talent by Jason Brubaker, um, because he outlines how he lives his entire life as he has a day job, full-time day job, and he wouldn't have it any other way, because the project he gets to work on at night is only for him. It's the one that he just cares about because he cares about it. Um, subsequently, it's a very successful project, and he's done really great stuff on Kickstarter, but... Because he has that day job, he doesn't have to sacrifice anything in that project that he does at night when he works on that, the stuff he cares about. Um, so that's a great book. The, the next question is, how would you rate the importance of allowing yourself time to breathe versus getting a project done quickly when planning a production schedule and creating goals slash milestones? Or is that not something you typically consider? What, what's a break? I don't Breathing? <laughs> Never. So no, watching really... Teen Wolf, and the... <laughs> you get to catch an episode of Teen Wolf. That's your. I, I think having rewards for the work that you're doing and giving yourself space. This is one of the things I've really been wrestling in the past year. Like coming up on my second full year of being full time freelance is having to learn how to make sure I don't suffer from extreme burnout, um, which is a, a real and horrible problem. Uh, and it's it's been kind of humbling to realize like oh there's only a certain amount of creative work you can get done per day and having to actually limit the time that I spend on projects so that I'm still recharged the following day, I'm still ready to go. The temptation to tell a client, I can do this project in three hours and have it to you by this afternoon is really strong because you want to be fast, you want to be the best, you want to you know, impress everybody with how speedy you are. But then you know things come up and then you, oh, you, you had an unexpected lunch date or like you have another project that got in the way. Um, and then you have to email your client and say, oh, sorry, it's going to be late, and that never looks good. So you tell your client you can get it done in nine hours or a day, and then you look like a hero when you get it in in three hours. And I think that also goes for personal projects, right? Like, budget three times the amount of time you think it's going to take, because there's going to be mornings where um, the, it, you have to strike that balance between pushing yourself to get the work done even when you don't want to and knowing when it's time to back off and go for a walk or drink some tea or take a breath. Well, um, and, and that, so burnout, that burnout is is tremendous. It's not to say you can't do the work in three hours. You probably could, but then you also got to give yourself another like two to three hours of recovery where you're completely wiped from all of the work that you just did. Because it's, it's the same. It's the equivalent of sprinting. As yeah, it's it's jogging. super dangerous to know exactly what you're capable of because then you want to be capable of it all the time. And it's like, yeah, I can ink and color 19 pages in a week, but I don't want to. <laughs> it would not be good for me. Jerry, do you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I think um, if you're not... Um, sorry, my cat is bothering me. If you're, not, um, if you're not to the point where you're strictly freelance and you have the opportunity, or if you're in the 
in the uh, position to have the time. I think it's important to take time to invest in your growth. Um, I know, like, what I do is I have, like, a series of exercises that I do every day, just consider, and that's part of why I have a webcomic that updates twice a week. It's a deadline, and I consider it sort of like push-ups. Um, and before I start, I have a certain number of things I do for a workout before I start drawing, and um, be syst and also to be systematic about it. Pick the things that you're like, if you're not good at hands, then try drawing 50 hands before you start drawing anything else as just a warm-up uh, to get ready. Um, and then I also think in terms of personal growth, it's good to expand your mind by, like, pick a, a period of art that you don't know a lot about, or, like, the Pre-Raphaelites or the Golden Age illustrators, or pick an artist, um, and really just, like, dive in to learn a lot about them, or study how they, like, handle hands and draw or uh, paint or their process or what it's like. Um, go to museums and go to other cities, you know, just to try to expand yourself um, and read novels. You know, I think all of that stuff helps invest in your art. And trying other mediums, too. I'm sorry, I'm going on too long. Um, <laughs> I think it's like, like if you're, like, it's important to try a, a different kinds of medium when you're drawing um, because it's like, like if you're gardening and you're growing tomatoes, like, they're probably going to be really good. But if you grow a basil plant next to the tomatoes, like, they're going to be extra good and taste like basil. So it's important when you're planting the seeds of the stuff. Did I lose you guys? It's no, 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 you're go, good. Go, go. <laughs> Bring it out. Keep going. Uh, of, um, I want my comics to smell like basil. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's important when you're planting the seeds of uh, your, your growth to uh, plant different kinds of seeds because they'll all grow together. And in your garden, uh, you'll be able to go everywhere. This, this next question um, is, is kind of interesting. This is uh, from Michael Freely in Portland, Maine, Northeast, Northeast represent. Um, okay, so how do you schedule aspects of the comic creation process when you don't know how long it will take? I know how much time to storyboard, draw, ink, and paint a page, but I have yet to predict how long writing it will take. Any thoughts or advice? And I think I want to talk to uh, Eric and Christy about the writing and how you plan for that process. Eric? Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure how to explain how to plan for writing process. Um, if you have a certain amount of time to do the writing, then you've got to get it done in that amount of time. Um, you've got to put your butt in a chair put yourself in front of the computer if that's what you're writing on, or put yourself by the desk in front of a piece of paper if that's what you're writing on, and you've got to spend your time uh, putting the putting words on paper or on the computer screen. Uh, it, it may not be very good, but the more time you spend actually getting it out, the better it's going to get. Um, and you've got to learn to access the part of your brain that comes up with ideas. I mean, I guess I'm talking mostly about uh, if you don't have any ideas to start out with, uh, if you if you're if you've been writing comics for a while, uh, after a while you'll probably become familiar with uh, how much you can actually get written. Um, particularly if you've already established how much how long it takes you to write and draw. I mean, draw pages. Uh, you'll get a feel for writing too. Um, also, uh, I don't know what type of projects exactly you're talking about. If you're talking about graphic novels, that's one type of project. Uh, if you're talking about an ongoing series, that's something else where it's an ongoing relationship with characters and situations that will start spawning other ideas. Um, have I answered sufficiently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of ongoing series, uh, Christy, do you want to talk a little bit about because because uh, Charlie Wormwood's been how long have, has that comic been coming out now? Uh, right now, it's uh, we have 28 issues up online. Uh, we have another 12 uh, ready to go. Um, so it's it's been going for so 28 weeks. Then we took a break, and the break ended up being longer because uh, my artist got a great job with the French publisher, although it makes me very sad. Happy for him, sad for me. 
Um, but then I did get you, so it's okay. Right. Um, right. It, it's really hard. Uh, one thing when, when a lot of times I'll think of a title, I'll just, I'm, I'm kind of stupid. I'll just think of a title and I'll go, oh my gosh, that's a great idea for a comic. <laughs> that would be so cool. I would buy that comic just from the title. And then I go to sleep at night, and then I dream the first part of the comic, and I wake up at 3, like I do every day, or every morning, and I write it down. And then sometimes I wake up and read it the next morning and go, oh my gosh, I, I can't eat that anymore before I go to bed. And then sometimes, because it's just totally stupid, or sometimes it's really great, um, and, and I love it. If I get stuck, a lot of times I'll just I'll go take a shower, because that's it, it is really a good place to to get your mind clear and then come up with some ideas and just kind of take you, it gives you like a little break. Um, sometimes I'll sit down and I'll have to write something and I just, I just can't. I just, there, there's no way I can write it. And then sometimes I'll sit down and I can just write and just write and write and write and write and, and my characters go different directions and it's just great. Um, so it's just kind of, it's just, it's different for everybody. I know some writer friends of mine that can just sit down at 8 o'clock every day and write until 5 o'clock every night and then shut it off. And there is no way I, I could do that. There's just no way. I can't, it's, you know, one, I don't want an 8 to 5 job. That's, that's not me. But I just, um, I just, it, it's different for everybody. Um, you just have to kind of feel, uh, you just kind of have to feel it, you, you know. And sometimes I can't write heavy stuff, and sometimes I can write. I I can. It just it depends on your mood. It depends on. I changed off my office location once because my kids kept walking through, and I couldn't do anything because I'd be right in the middle of something brilliant, and then they you know just walk through and try and be real quiet, and then it just doesn't work. It's just a distraction. So yeah, I, just. You know, your cat jumps up on you like, you know, Jared's having that problem. I've been having that problem with <laughs> my mentally challenged cat. Um, so it is. I'm well, not making that up. <laughs> and, I, and I feel like uh, I have a lot of friends. I like to surround myself by writers um, because I envy them mostly. Like I wish I, I do with artists <laughs> as well, but I'm more threatened by them than I envy them. Um, the <laughs> like good artists, I'm like, damn you for being better than me. But like... Um, there is something that I know from all my writer friends who do have it as a full-time job where you have to make habits and rituals around your work. Um, where where I, I remember reading about Maya Angelou would go, she has a hotel room like on the other side of town where she lives and she would go and write. It was empty and it just has a typewriter in the middle of it. And she'd just wake up in the morning, go to that hotel room and type like a bunch of garbage and then throw it all out. And then she was like, now I can start writing. But there was like this trigger in her head that was like, now it's writing time. Now is the time for my brain to start doing this kind of work. Yeah, um, Twyla, Twyla Tharp has a really great book called The Creative Habit, which is about this process. And um, the, the ritual that she described, she's a choreographer. But her morning routine of getting up in New York and going to the gym and conditioning and stretching, the routine has nothing to do with the stretching and the going to the gym. The routine is getting up and getting into the cab by 5.15, and like once she's in the cab ride, an inexorable chain of events has been set in motion that she can't prevent, and it's like as soon as you, you know, grease the groove to the point where you start doing that thing and you can just relax into it, I think that can get, get a lot of people over that, that hump of feeling like they're stuck against writer's block or they can't do it or it's not good enough. Do you guys uh, all have rituals for your work, or is that a foreign... Con can, do we want to share some of our rituals? <laughs> 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 I'll share Linda Berry's. Has anyone else taken a Linda Berry writing class before? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, she first of all, she um, it's actually some of it's in uh the John and Quarterly books, but um, she'll have you like maybe write down like the first eight cars you ever remember being in, um, or your first eight friends, and you have to look at the list and then you have to choose one, and then um, she makes you like she asks you a bunch of questions like um. Where were you when you first met? What time of day was it? What could you smell? What's in front of you? What's on your feet? Like all these like weird details that you not, might not necessarily think about in your memories. And then, and this is what how she starts right. She reads like this uh, poem by Rumi, like "You are yourselves the master of the hunt" or whatever. And it's like it's almost hypnotic um, to hear it. I mean, while you're like drawing like a spiral or something while she's reading. And then she's like, "You have eight minutes, right?" And then you're just writing about this person or first car or whatnot, and then um, you only have eight minutes, and she, like, gives you check, and she's like, three minutes, one minute, 30 seconds, and by the time you're done, you've actually, like, written 
something that has a beginning, middle, and end almost every time. So then you have like all these tiny little stories you can. So if you're ever having writer's block, I would uh, picture this and uh, what it is are the books um, that she wrote, and I think those are really helpful for getting out of writer's block. Um, I think what all those do is teach you to uh, access your subconscious, which I think is basically the technique that you need to do if you're having writer's block to get started. Get started writing, just get yourself out of the way and access your subconscious and let that come out on the page or on the computer screen. And I think that's what all those um, Linda Berry exercises are, are doing, and they can be very useful. I wish I could stick to my rituals, but it's surprisingly hard to come up with that much kitten blood on a weekly basis. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, I think I think you know I studied a lot of behavioral uh, psychology uh, when I was studying to become a teacher, and you'd be shocked at how much your environment and how much the way that you place and how much the sounds and the ty time of day and like the signifiers really play a role in the subconscious knowing, oh, this is what I'm doing, which is what Lucy was talking about when you go. When, when that woman get on the, the taxi. It's like, well, because then all of these things have been set in motion and your body's like, this is how it feel comfortable behaving. I think the first time you do it is going to be hard. The first time creating any ritual for your artistic process is really, really, really difficult because you've never done it before. But then, if you do it once, it becomes easier. The second time, it becomes normal. And then the third time, you get to zone out while you're actually doing the thing that you already know how to do. Um, so it, it's really about normalizing that that process. Next question for Jared. Uh, oh. Baba's accordion is such a wonderful short story. Oh. Um, it's from Melissa in New York City. That wasn't a question. How long did it take oh. to make this short comic from initial concept to printed book? What was the schedule like, and how did it differ from the pea green coffee cup comic schedule? Well, um. Okay, so it, that one took two months, um, and it was very different from Pea Green Coffee Cup, um, because Pea Green Coffee Cup is very short installment set, or twice a week, and right now I have a writer who writes them ahead of time. Um, so they only take like six hours a comic to get done, but that's because my friend um, Kelly writes them, and then that's my process for uh, inking and uh, penciling and inking and then digitally coloring an 11 by 17 page. Um, for Baba's Accordion, I wrote that story. It took two months. Um, for me, uh, I have a system for writing that I kind of developed through, through you know, working on writing and then working with other people. And for that particular story, Baba's Accordion, um, I figure out kind of the concept that I wanted to have for the story, um, and then I build the story around that particular concept. Um, and then once I have kind of a framework of the story, because I, I have the problem of, like, and I don't know if other people who just mostly draw are like this, I can, like, almost daydream a very specific picture of a character and know every detail about how the fabric sits on them and how thick it is or heavy, um, or whether on a sh they're on a ship or on some kind of thing. And I can see very clearly every fiber of hair on that person, uh, but have no context or story uh, or idea behind them. I just can visualize this thing. So um, I have a very difficult time writing. So I like to do a lot of little things around the writing in order to develop the writing uh, so that it comes together. So what I'll do is I'll have the concept, and then I'll develop an idea for the story, and then I'll, I'll make a, a quick timeline, so like a, a, just a line across a piece of paper. that will be start and end, and then I'll write the end of the thing, if I have the end, and the start, and then the middle, and I'll kind of build... And sometimes it's years, because I've had other stories that take place over years. So it'll be like 1957 to 1987, and then I fill in what's going on with the character's life and kind of develop and build that way, or develop and build what happened in that character's life that made them make decisions that they make, um, or the person that they are. Um, and then from there, I'll do storyboards. So I just sort of try to think of, uh, like I'm playing a movie, but from different scenes, and try to develop what kind of concept of the angle will communicate the story because it's important that every line that you put down and every uh, camera angle or facial expression is all moving the, for the, the, for the story forward. You don't want to stop the flow of the story. So I'll try to figure out what kind of 
medium I want to use for the story, uh, how I want the camera angles to express the feeling um, of what the characters are feeling and tell the story, as well as the actual story being told. Um, and then I'll develop a grid on an 11 by, and that one was 11 by 17. And then I'll take, I'll do storyboards of the kind of movie in my head, and then I'll break those storyboards down into thumbnail pages uh, in, in spreads. It's also important to try to consider things in spreads and consider the entire composition of the page and the entire composition of the spread and what potentials those have for moving the story forward and the flow of the story. And then um, from there, I'll just, then it's just sort of, you're the machine, you know, it's just hammering out. Once you get those thumbnails figured out, or, um, it's just it's just making it, just doing the pages. You're, you're pointing out this really interesting thing where, like, you're choosing uh, your constraints before you start, and I think that that's one of the big differences between the webcomic medium where you could be work, or the weekly webcomic medium where you could be working over the course of several years versus a project that you're focusing on and getting out in a very short period of time because um, you, you can see that webcomics tend to stylistically shift as uh, comic creators work on them, um, unless they're very experienced, like Drew, Drew Ames working on a new webcomic right now that's coming out very quickly. Um, and it's, it's terrific. It's amazing. Um, mm-hmm. But you can see that he chose a lot of things, and very differently than his set to see book. Like, he, he had a very lots of stylistic cha- differences and in, in, in choices that he made. Um, right. The next question is for Eric. Um, you write a script differently, Eric, uh, for, and this is from John E. in New Jersey. Uh, do you write a script differently for something you're do, going to illustrate yourself versus what you will give to a collaborative artist? Yes. Uh, for myself, I, I write longhand because no one can read my writing, but I'm the only one who has to read it. Whereas for someone else, I'll type it on the computer. Um, I'll, my Panel descriptions will be much fuller for someone else, and th- that's about the, the difference. Though. Yeah, you you but can't it. use shorthand basically, right? Like you you know, you can write notes to yourself and. Yeah, I mean, I know what the characters are going to look like for myself, but if there's some particular thing that's uh, very story specific, that about a character, I'll I'll need to put that in the panel description. I mean, that's just a for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, the next question, this is one that I wanted to talk to with the people who are, there's a lot of people here working on digital medium. Um, this is probably our last question for the evening, actually. Um, do you think once a week or twice a week is okay for weekly updates of a webcomic intended to be long-term, or will readers be bored? And the reason why I think this is an interesting question is because I think it skips over some basic assumptions that you have about engaging readership. But before I get into my theories about that, um, I wanted to see if uh, Jen had anything to add to this kind of... This <laughs> what? <laughs> I was like, when was the last well, I mean, had a I, webcomic? Like, I mean, you look at a lot of comics, Jen. Like, the, the, the reason why I'm asking you is because, you know, job is to look at a ton of ton of comics, and so is Christie's. I really want to get her opinion about this. But, like, this, this idea of What's that balance that you have to strike internally? Because webcomics mean, as opposed to like what Eric was saying, where a project's completely done, right? Like, you're releasing it slowly. Like Drew's book yeah. uh, I mean, that he's releasing online. Reading a webcomic is usually like being thirsty. So if you like a drop or two of it, you'll keep coming back, but people aren't going to get the full sense of part of the story until there's like enough of a cup to drink, like to quench your thirst. So um, my uh, gentleman friend is a colorist, <laughs> Ryan Hill. Uh, <laughs> I, so delicate. My, my slam piece slash boyfriend, both right? um, <laughs> he, uh He was reading a comic. I, I feel really bad. I can't remember it. But literally it was like the fourth or fifth page of it completely. And it just started like a month ago. And he was like posting about it online. He was so excited about it just because those four pages excited him. So it's it really is like a, a trickle over time and it, it will take a while. But I I think um, whatever your schedule is, as anyone with webcom will tell you, just stick to it. I did Definitely. once a week. I did it once a week for mine and it was great for me. But I did like full, you know, um, a full, like, you know, 
two full page with like watercolors. So I mean, that's that's why it took so long. So. Wow. Even uh, even if you even if you lapse or you can't maintain a regular schedule, just don't stop. Like yeah. eventually, you're gonna have enough of a product to you know either shop around to publishers or to to put it self published together yourself or to uh, per, you know put a cohesive body of work online that people can look at. Like just just don't give up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, every day is a new day. Yeah. Or no, conversely, I, I never stop giving up. Like never stop giving yeah. yourself another chance to give up. Well, and this is, I've stressed this in the beginning, in one of the first articles I gave the students this week, this, this idea of assessing what your goals are in the project before you even start working on it is so important because, like, if your goal is to create an award-winning comic, that's so vague of a goal, and especially if it's your first one, it's probably not going to happen. Like, I mean, the, the likelihood of it happening is so slim with your first work. And as Anne Lamott says in Bird by Bird, the people who just do great the first time they do things, we don't like those people anyway, so we shouldn't really talk about them. Um, they're, but... they're, they're also liars, just so everyone knows from a marketing standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, this, this award-winning thing was my very first time I picked up a pen and drew something. Mm, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and with Hipster Picnic, I, I kind of chronicled this. It's been interesting that that's actually gotten a resurgence, and I'm now publishing it again on uh, Go Comics because I literally never wanted to work on that again after I finished the first 50 pages because my goal was to do 50 pages. And then I was like, I don't care anymore about this. And it just the editor found it when the, the My Arm the Comic came out, and she was like, I, we want you to do Hipster Picnic again. I was like, okay. But I mean, like, so... I think when you're looking at the work you're doing, you have to say to yourself, what are you hoping to get out of it? Um, And and really concentrate on that because it was really hard during those 50 pages of work on Hipster Picnic to not have people like loving it by page four Mm. or even five or six or 40. (laughs) Just think of uh, of Craig Thompson working on like his first or second book. You know, he wasn't getting stuff every day, especially when he had, you know, like 600 pages, like people won't forget you. They just, you know, you may fall out of like I don't know, the internet's favor for a bit, but yeah. Well, and I think that's an important thing to talk about too. This whole idea, that the, when the tattoo thing blew up last, last fall, I was shocked at how quickly I was just like a thing and then not something that anybody remembered the next day. And I yeah. think if you're trying to go after attention for your work, and that's your sole assessment for your work, you're not doing it for the right reasons. Like, you kind of need to step back and be like uh, what Jared just said about humility um, and and gratitude for the work because you're spending nine hours, you know, potentially, or six hours or several hours a day. You're the one who loves this artwork as if it was a child. And, um, you know, other people are going to consume it like it's popcorn. Um, <laughs> they shouldn't be the only people. You need to care about it more than they do. <laughs> well, yeah, but I think this is also where the social media comes in. This is when you really need to be using that to push your product. Because the internet is so noisy. You can say something and it's... I mean, Brian K. Vaughn was talking about this. He's he's Brian K. Vaughn and he puts out Private Eye and mm-hmm. people flock to it. And then a couple days later when he wasn't tweeting about it and Marcos Martin wasn't tweeting about it, it just kind of went away and nobody was... was was looking at it. Now if that's going to happen to him if somebody's just starting you really have to take that in consideration so that's why the you really have to you know get that social marketing out there. You need to use Twitter and Facebook and keep keep your comics name out there. I think well, that's I, really important. I think what Jared was saying earlier the, the garden metaphor is also important here though because I come across feeds sometime where the only thing you see from a person is here's a link to my comic, read my comic, new page of my comic, do this thing with my comic, like it's just mm-hmm. relentless yeah. marketing and I may be a little biased here because a lot of what I do is autobiographical, right, so people are not just buying into the comics I'm producing, they're buying into me as a, as a creator, as an entity, as a personality, whatever, and I think that that's where having sort of a well a well rounded presentation of yourself online can really help get that um, that slow burn like the the slow trickle of gathering followers. That's not necessarily what Patrick experienced, right? Where I'm sure that's happened to all of us, where something blows up and you get a huge amount of traffic, but then it's gone, just like that. And the people who are invested in you, not just the idle curiosity of oh I'm going to click this link, 
they're the ones who are going to stick around and keep coming back and keep investing in Yeah, them. you're going after your accolades. You're not going after the uh, the mobs and the masses. You want the people who are really like fighting for your work. I don't know, I kind of like a mob. To be your ch- to commit. Yeah. <laughs> the mob. <laughs> one well, day. we don't like the mob I, at, at one point or another. I, yeah. Um, well, it's now the time to wrap up. I don't know if anybody else was keeping an eye on the clock, but I was. Um, I, I think we should go. <laughs> I think we should go through and uh, let everybody plug anything that they want to plug. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, just pr- promote yourselves right now. So we'll start with Lucy, and then we'll move down the list in the same order that we went before. Um, you can find my stuff online. It's super easy. I am at lucybellwood.com. My Twitter handle is here. I am also lucybellwood.tumblr.com. Um, I have comics that are going to be coming out over the course of the summer. I'm the most the one I'm most excited about is I'll be traveling to the East Coast to work on a wooden whaling vessel and doing some uh, journalism comics about that experience. So I was a tall ship sailor in a former life um, before I became a cartoonist. Cool. And that's, where my comics and uh, life interests intersect. So I'm really excited to be working on that. You can look for that coming out in August or September. Uh, uh, who's next? Uh, Jen. Oh, um, uh, my Twitter handle is the Genya, J-E-N-Y-A, and I have a comic that should be updating soon um, on Comixology called Avery Fatbottom, Renaissance Fair Detective. Uh, issue number one's out right now. And I'm also working on some Adventure Time regular show stuff and some secret things I can't talk about. But um, and for Fantagraphics, I will be at line work this weekend Woo! in Portland, and I will have the most <laughs> rad ass science fiction uh, graphic novel, Twelve Gems by Lane Milborn. It is so good. Um, the Amateurs, which is definitely like a, a oh, like a Twilight Zone episode. Um, uh, I'll have a couple Age of License galleys that you can look at by Lucy Nisley. And, mm-hmm, and then one more, Esther Paul Watson's Unlovable, which is one of my favorite series ever. It's number three. She uh, supposedly found a 1980s uh, diary in a bathroom, and mm-hmm. then it's in the back of, yeah, and then she uh, draws it. It's just so grotesque. She's actually featured on uh, Neil... Uh... No, I'm forgetting his name, but the Comics Everywhere documentary that's being filmed down here in San Diego, she's actually featured in that, uh, which is interesting. It's not Kendricks. done yet. Neil Kendricks. Kendricks. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin. Yeah, 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 NPH, got it. Um, uh, are you gonna, is anybody going to be at WonderCon? Anybody? No. I'm going on Saturday. No. You are? I'll We're going to be up there Saturday. We need to hang out. It's what about TCAF? Lucy, T-Caf! you and me. Lucy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you are, yeah, that's right. You're going to be there for fan graphics. Okay. Yeah, sorry. What about right. VanCAF? Yeah, I will be at VanCAF. Van yeah. yeah. I feel <laughs> very <laughs> left out of the party at this point. <laughs> right, Gary, do you want to do want to plug some stuff? Um uh, well, you can find pretty much everything I do at jaredlovestodraw.com um, and my Tweets and uh, Tumbletown and all of that type of stuff is on there. Um, and also my comics, links to my comics and stuff. Um, my webcomic updates twice a week. It's Pea Green Coffee Cup. Um, I'm working on a children's book right now. Uh, and then some other comics for anthologies that are that are going to be out at some point. I can't really post anything about them until they're printed. But, um, but they'll be on jaredlovestodraw.com. Uh, so if you go there, you can find all that stuff. Cool. Eric? Well, my website is www.age-of-bronze.com. That's because I do Age of Bronze. Which is amazing. It's a good book. I I have it over there. Uh, I also just recently finished working on a series of adaptations of L. Frank Baum's Oz books for Marvel. This is the first one. There, we did six of them. The art is by Scotty Young. They're being collected into an omnibus edition, which will be out in September. In August, my series that I just finished writing, Little Nemo Return to Slumberland, will be out from IDW with art by Gabe Rodriguez. Uh, we're going to be at WonderCon this weekend. I mean, not next weekend, talking about that on, on some IDW panel. And... Uh, what else am I doing? Oh, I'm producing this vintage stage mu- musical from 1913 right now, the TikTok Man of Oz. So there's a, I have a Kickstarter up for two more days. So if you're interested, pledge, please. 
<laughs> Damon. Um, I mean, check out my book, Sabretooth Swordsman. Woo! Sabretooth Swordsman from Dark Horse Comics. Uh, I've got a website, invademyprivacy.com, that I update very infrequently with dumps from uh, from me and Aaron, news from me and Aaron Conley. My Twitter is at invademyprivacy. Uh, you can find Aaron Conley and Damon Gentry. That's my name on Facebook. Dot comics. No, just com. DHP. Uh, we had an eight-page colors. It was colored by Sloane Leong, who is a brilliant yes. artist. Yes. She's she's super amazing. She's in Portland. Um, we're doing a, another one for DHP number one, the reboot that's happening in August. Uh, we're gonna do some stuff for Brandon Graham's Profit Strike File, which is kind of a follow-up after Profit ends. Um, you can check out some other work that I've done. I, I did a I wrote a story that Mike Allred drew for Erie Comics number two from Dark Horse, and uh, Aaron and I both did pinups for Shaolin Cowboy from Jeff Darrow. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I also just want to real quick recommend this self-published book by our buddy Matt Allison. It's called Kankor, and you can find it if you look up Calamity of Challenge or, or Loaf Dish uh, blog blog spot. And it's super weirdo, really funny, amazing stuff that I can't recommend enough. Um, and then I'll be at line work this weekend, wandering around like a hobo mostly, but signing at the Dark Horse table at 3 p.m. And maybe so, uh, watching the Fanographics booth when I go to the bathroom. And watching the Fanographics booth for Jen when she goes to the bathroom. <laughs> so, so, so if you're there, come stick your face in my face. We'll have FaceTime. <laughs> Not on your iPhone, though. Uh, no. Christy. <laughs> um... I've got The Damnation of Charlie Wormwood that is returning soon at Thrillbent.com. Uh, we are uh, changing artists, so uh, you should read it to see what Patrick does with, with it. It'll be amazing. And you can still join uh, the Super MOOC. You can, can go to supermook.org or uh, just look us up at Social Issues Through Comic Books and you can find out all your information there. We've got some great interviews, great lectures all sorts of things if you're interested. Um, that's that's it. And uh, next we're going to have Kevin uh, talk a little bit about what's coming up for 13thDimension.com. 13th Dimension, it's going to be, uh, we're going to be highlighting this week's good stuff, which is uh, a lot of the scheduling strategies and techniques that we talked about uh, on here and in the MOOC itself. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be very interesting. Uh, we, we also posted up a what to read on 13thDimension.com yeah. uh, today. Kevin and I co-wrote co that. And there's some really good picks for, for book stuff, including Drew Wang and uh, um, Craig Thompson. Um, some, some really good recommends on that. Um, I'm gonna, I've never done this. I'm going to plug my, my own comic, which I have one, uh, over at gocomics.com forward slash Head comics. Uh, it's it's kind of a gag strip. I, I describe it as Twenty Eight Days Later meets uh, Perfect Strangers. Um, so so it's pretty awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's about it. That's a wrap for this evening. So I just want to say thank you guys all for coming. Um, thanks to the panelists for lending us their brains and faces and um, and and navigating the the this labyrinth of Google Plus stuff to get here because <laughs> you, you now got the prize. This is the prize. Like Boom. you got to be on the hangout. <laughs> that was, that so was cool. I was told there would be cake. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, ba I baked one, but the smell plugin isn't working over on on Google Plus right now. So. <laughs> I was told there would be booze. Oh, <laughs> wait, wait, where? There it is. Again, that plugin's not working. Um, they're in beta uh, for, for that thing. All right, line work. Anyway, anyway, let's yeah. go. Um, thank you guys all, and uh, thank you. Looking forward to next thank week. Thank you, Patrick. Bye. Thanks, Patrick. Bye bye. Thank you.